The Writings of John Burroughs, Volume 8, Indoor Studies. Mr. Burroughs at his study table. Brief Essays, The Biologist's Tree of Life. One of the most helpful and satisfactory conceptions of modern biological science is the conception of the animal life of the globe under the image of a tree. A tree which has its root and trunk in the remote past and its outermost twigs and branches in our own day. And moreover, a tree which has attained its growth, which has reached its maturity, and whose history in the far future must be marked by a slow decline. This is the tree of life of the evolutionist and affords the key to the class natural classification of the animal kingdom as taught by Darwin and others and as opposed to the artificial or arbitrary classification of Cuvier and the older naturalists. This tree first emerges in view in the Silurian age probably not less than 50 million years ago and emerges as a pretty well-developed tree that is as having many branches. Its trunk is beyond our ken hidden in still more remote ages. No fossils have been found in rocks older than the Silurian. But if evolution is true, it is pretty certain that there must have been life on the globe long before that date. Our tree must have started as a single shoot, but this single stem, our first parent form, has not been found. The biologist is convinced that the very first forms of life were soft and very perishable, and that therefore no record of them could be preserved in the sedimentary rocks. But the latter forms which led up to and were the parents of those which emerge in view in the Silurian age must have been capable of fossilization. A record of them doubtless exists somewhere and may in time be brought to light. Darwin thought the record was probably in the rocks beneath the sea, as it is certain the sea and the land have changed places, or the record may be in the Arctic regions where some naturalists believe life first began. Seeing this part of the Earth's surface would be the first to cool and become of a temperature that admitted of animal life. In any case, but a mere fraction of the record, hardly more than a few pages out of many large volumes is accessible, and has been subject to scrutiny. The roots and trunk of our tree must be assumed to have existed. We assume that language began in rude sounds and grunts and signs as we see it begin in a child, though of course no record of them could be preserved and that it has developed from these into the marvelous structure which is now, which we now behold branching and refining and specializing almost endlessly. In the Silurian age then, we strike the top of a the tree of life. All the great branches are represented. All the important classes of animals have made their appearance, even the vertebrates being represented in the upper Silurian by fishes. Of this tree, the sub-kingdoms represent the great branches. The classes represent their division, the orders theirs, the family theirs, and so up to species, which represent the terminal twigs. The abundance of specialized forms in the Silurian age, that is, the many smaller branches that appear and the absence of two generalized forms or main branches that must have preceded them is one of the main obstacles in the way of the evolution theory, a theory of gen generic descent. But those parent branches, as I, as I have said, are hidden in the record of them, has not been found, probably never can be found. It is very certain, not only from direct evidence, but in light of the analogy, that the forces of nature, vital and other, were much more active in the early geologic ages than they are now. It was the youth of the world. Why should they not be more active? Why should there not have been more fluids and gases and more rapid growths and changes? There was more heat, doubtless, more rapid evaporation and more copious precipitation. Our rivers and lakes and watercourses are but a fraction of what they were in comparatively recent geologic times. This tree of life grew rapidly in those warm, moist May and June days of the Silurian and Devonian epochs. New species appeared with comparative suddenness. The life of the globe was full and riotous. Enormous forms began to appear flying dragons and terrible and grotesque monsters of the deep. 
there was a plethora of power and excess of mere animal life. But as the ages rolled on, nature began to sober down, her pace became slower and more deliberate, and she began to rise on stepping stones of her dead self. The higher forms of life began to appear, birds emerged, mammals came forth. In the tertiary age, the brains of mammals, according to Marsh, began to increase in size. Henceforth, the struggle was not to be one of physical strength merely, but intelligence also began to play a part. The maturity of the tree of life was approaching. That the geological changes were more rapid in the earlier history of the earth than they are now seems to me to admit of no doubt. The forces of the globe were more restless and titanic. They had not yet attained to the equilibrium and the repose that we now see. The crust of the earth was thinner. The internal fires were nearer. The solid ground was less solid than, than that we now walk upon. Volcanoes were more active, earthquakes more frequent. The crust of the earth still throbs and palpitates under the influence of lunar and solar attraction and of unequal atmospheric pressure. Think then how much more it must have been done so, say in the Silurian age. The cataclysmal theories of the earlier geologists have been much modified by Lyle and his school, but so far as they imply greater volume and activity in past ages of the physical forces, they have shaped the earth, they are doubtless true. In the tertiary age, these forces became much more gentle and uniform in their workings, as changes in the earth's surface would be the most powerful factor in bringing about changes of species, we see why new species seem to have made their appearance so suddenly in earlier geologic times. There can be but little doubt that the earth has at last reached the maturity of her powers. She is like a ripe apple upon the bough. Henceforth its excellence must show decline. The game of life upon this planet has been essentially played. That is, no new developments remain, no new species on any extended scale, as in the past, are to appear. The bird has been evolved from the reptile, but the bird is doubtless the top of that branch of our tree of life. No new form is to be evolved from the bird. We know pretty well the evolution of the horse. He has arisen through various lower and lesser forms, but probably nothing is to come after the horse. The same with other forms. No higher form is to succeed man as he has succeeded the lower. Monkeys and orangs are left behind. They will not give birth to a being superior to themselves. They are twigs that have been outstripped by other and more favored branches. Man is the last of the series. Superior races may arise, but not a new and superior type of being. And it is very doubtful about the superior race. There are those who believe the race culminated in the Greeks over 2,000 years ago. After the earth has been thoroughly subdued and possessed by the dominant races, as it will be, in a few hundred years more, the topmost branch of the tree will probably begin to fail in vitality and fruitfulness. But just what form the decline will take can only be a matter of speculation. We only now, we only know that all things have their periods and are safe in inferring that life of the globe as a whole will have its period just as surely as any tree in the forest or any plant in the field has its period. Why should it not be so? We know any and every single form perishes, why should not the earth itself grow and die, grow old and die? The life of man is typical of the life of the earth. The stages of an, of an orb's life, say the astronomers, are stages of cooling. So are the stages of man's life. It is a process of cooling and hardening from youth to age. To think of the gaseous, nebulous, out of which the man is gathered and consolidated. Fiery storms, vapory at first, then cold, hard, sterile, at last.